America's war on drugs has turned into a national nightmare. The CIA has recently been enlisted to fight the global drug trade. At the same time, however, critics have charged that the agency contributed to the present drug crisis. The United States government turned their head and let this cocaine come into the United States of America. We are sick and tired of your excuses. Accusations that the CIA started the crack epidemic were set off by a San Jose Mercury news report that appeared in the summer of 1996. The front page series claimed that supporters of the CIA-backed Contras sold cheap cocaine to L.A. street gangs to help finance the war in Central America. It is an appalling charge. It is an appalling charge that goes to the heart of this country. The CIA denied the Mercury News charges, which were also discredited in the media. However, for years, various reports have linked CIA covert operations to foreign drug traffickers. There's never a time in all these years that the CIA is not involved with drug traffickers, because the drug traffickers so often are the security forces whose purpose is to er eradicate the drug trade, but who become traffickers themselves. It started right at the beginning of the Cold War when the CIA helped Corsican gangsters keep the French communists from taking control of the port of Marseille. For the next 25 years, the Corsican mob used the port to ship heroin to America. The blowback was called the French Connection. The best people to work with are criminals. And the reason is they know how to evade the law locally. They have the networks, the hideouts. They know who in the government is corrupt. They probably have already bought the police. They're perfect natural allies. In the 1960s, as the CIA expanded its covert operations to the war zones of Southeast Asia, it recruited tribal leaders who used the agency alliance to become drug lords. Opium and the transfer and the trafficking goes with the title of commander general. Tony Poe trained Hmong tribesmen to fight the CIA's secret war in Laos. He also tried to keep their opium crop off the market. By the late 1960s, the CIA's various covert action partners were transporting heroin from the Golden Triangle to sell to GIs in Vietnam. A presidential report concluded that by 1971, more than a third of the U.S. troops in Vietnam were using heroin. Thousands of troops in Vietnam and thousands of discharged veterans are heroin addicts. A 1972 internal CIA report stated, the past involvement of many of these Laotian officers in drugs is well known. The war has clearly been our overriding priority in Southeast Asia. It would be foolish to deny this and we see no reason to do so. A decade later in Afghanistan, once again, the agency found itself backing opium-growing rebels. There were different commanders with different views. We worked very hard to associate ourselves with those who were not involved in the drug trade. But it would be foolish to say that we didn't know there were others that were. <laughs> to support the Afghan resistance against the Soviet occupation, the CIA worked with Afghan rebels, who used the agency's arms, logistics, and support to become the region's largest drug lords. This area has become the leading source of heroin for America and Europe. During the 1980s in Latin America, the CIA's Cold War mission again collided with America's drug war. One of the CIA's informants who exploited his long relationship with the agency was Panama's General Manuel Noriega. A few months before I got to the CIA, when Noriega was on the CIA's payroll, I felt this was not a man the United States should be associated with. And during the entire Carter years, he was not on the U.S. payroll. Not once. As soon as we left, he went back on the payroll. In 1981, 
when William Casey succeeded Stansfield Turner, stopping the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua became the overriding priority in Central America. Noriega offered his assistance, and the CIA started working with him again, despite allegations of his criminal activities. Let's put it this way. Noriega probably wasn't a very nice man. He may have either killed people or been involved in people being killed. He may have been in the drug business, may not have been in the drug business. He may have been in the laundry business, money laundering business, or may not have been. I don't know. As long as Noriega supported the Contra War, the CIA and the Reagan-Bush administration overlooked his illegal enterprises. When the Contra War ended, Noriega's drug ties became a growing embarrassment for the CIA and for President Bush. The agency tried to instigate a coup against the dictator, but it was unsuccessful. We had people like Noriega, who we knew was heavily involved in narcotics trafficking and money laundering, but he was playing ball with us. He was giving us intelligence on the Cubans. Vice versa, he was giving the Cubans intelligence on us. When he refused to play ball with us, we took him out. The United States invaded Panama, and Noriega was extradited in the costliest drug bust in history. The general, who was eventually convicted and imprisoned on drug trafficking charges, was not the only CIA operative in Central America involved in the narcotics trade. During the 1980s, when the CIA was building the Contra Army, it needed people who knew how to move money and guns to Central America. Blowback struck when some of these operatives used the Contra supply network to fly illegal drugs north to the United States. I, we had gathered intelligence that the Contras were heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. Hangars 4 and 5 at Ilopango Airport in Salvador were owned and operated by the CIA. Our surveillance and our informants uh, revealed that they were heavily involved in narcotics trafficking. And uh, the informant was a guy who did the flight plans for all the Contra pilots, and it turned out that some of those pilots were documented in, D in DEA files as narcotics traffickers. In 1986, Senator John Kerry began investigating allegations of links between the CIA-backed Contras and drug traffickers. Are you aware of whether or not narcotics proceeds at some time may or may not have supported Contra efforts? Yes, sir. Narcotics proceeds were used to shore up the uh, Contra effort. Did you personally play a role in some of the transfer of that money? Yes, I did. In the course of the Contra War, the United States, as a matter of policy, abandoned drug law enforcement, looked the other way at the kinds of uh, conditions where we were creating that enhanced the ability of traffickers to move dope into the United States, and in effect allowed a drug trade to flourish, all to support the Contra movement and to support the war. Was any of the money traceable? to drugs or to drug-related transactions? The money that we, uh, you're talking about the money that we provided? That's right. No, sir. And why was that? Because we're experts at what we do. We permitted narcotics. I mean, we were complicitous as a country in narcotics traffic at the same time as we're spending countless dollars in this country to try to get rid of this problem as law enforcement officials risk their lives. How can you ask a DEA agent to go out there, risk their life, when there's a whole other policy out here that is willing to overlook narcotics? It's mind-boggling. The findings of the Kerry subcommittee did not receive much public attention. However, almost a decade later, the same questions are being asked. This lady here. Thank you so much for Mr. CIA official for being here, but I would just like to ask you how are we supposed to trust the CIA official to investigate themselves? I mean, we, we are having a problem with that. I did not expect to come here and find everybody applauding the remarks that I made. But I want you to know, I've come here and told you, unlike the other cases that you've mentioned, where there was nobody who came here and told you, there was no director of central intelligence who came out and told you there's going to be an investigation. That's something. 